have made so much progress in the last 10 years because of technological advancements. We can diagnose lots of things with brain scans, um, the things that were not possible and we know. And you can change little things that make a huge difference. Even things like putting a colored inlays in child's glasses, and suddenly they can see. Or getting your child tested for glue ear, and suddenly they can hear. And that, you know, putting them in front of a classroom in a different setting, in front of a teacher, they suddenly can hear. They suddenly can start um, um, writing and, and remember spelling. There are little things that can make a huge difference. But if you do not know it, you are not helping your child. So knowledge is power. So you need to do that. So what do you, what do, you do? Take away from this is. Trust your gut, follow your intuition, ask for help, look help, educate yourself, do search, um, get better, join associations. There are lots of places for dyslexia, for ADHD, for dyspraxia. There is so much information out there. Once you figure out what, that it's not normal or never typical what your child is doing, if you think that you know that they know much more, but it's not showing at school, go seek help, educational psychologists, clinical psychologists, even pediatric um, psychiatrists, they can all help you. You are not alone. But you need to then go with the information that you have acquired and go and talk to your schools, to your teachers. And then things can change very rapidly. You can sit down, you can make educational plans, you can um, s s map progress, you can ask for timelines, and you can track progress of your child. And you can, you can do things at home, you can do things at school. So you don't deny the opportunity of your child to actually get better. Just imagine um, what it is to be dyslexic. So if you are writing um, a story, imagine writing with the mirror against the writing and you see every second letter, you see bits and pieces of that. Or if you have ADHD, it's constantly doing your homework in, in a household with people around you, not being able to actually tune out of multiple conversations. You're constantly paying too much attention to too many things. You cannot make your brain um, slow down because of the um, narrow um, um, chemical uh, patterns in your brain. It is so hard on children who have special education needs to actually function in everyday setting because the way we set our, our classrooms and um, how we treat them. We know that, for instance, one in 10 children has dyslexia, one in 10, 20 children has um, ADHD, and about one in 40 here is on the autistic spectrum. It doesn't mean that they cannot function, but they cannot function in the school settings where they get punished if they move their bums on the chair or if they can't read very quickly. I think it's very important that we get away from the notion that everybody has dyslexia. It's still very much prevalent. I see that in UK much more than I see it in America. Um, for instance, we have moved on because, again, technology allows us to make better uh, diagnoses, better testing, and as a result, more effective um, treatment um, for each of the conditions. Again, if you get help, and you ha get help soon, um, you get to the root of the problem quickly, as soon as possible. There are so many things that we actually can do now these days at schools and how we accommodate children with special educational and behavioral needs. So they can get extra time for exams, they can bring calculators to, um, to school, they get extra support one-on-one -on -one in English. There are programs that can help teach children how to spell and remember spelling correctly. Although don't expect your dyslexic child to ever be a good speller, it does not really matter. They should be able to write and express themselves. There are different ways to express yourself, not just one way. Um, you know, you can teach them how to break down phonemes. You can get their eyes and ears tested. Um, you know, you can use, uh, for instance, um, graphs and pictures for learning. That helps uh, so much for, for children because they can make stories in their heads. So you can see often dyslexic children can learn to spell very difficult words or longer words because they make stories in their heads and they remember it. But they cannot spell there, there, there because for them in their head it doesn't make any sense. They see things in three and four, four Ds. They do not care about the simple letters put together because that, that, that's just not how their brain is wired, how it works. Um, one, um, my biggest, um, uh, I think, mission is there are things that we as a society are still quite rigid and we actually lose a tremendous amount of talent um, because there is no one way to become successful. There is no one way to be smart. Uh, and my argument today and always 
is that we need to spend less time trying to fix children, but we need to put more time and effort in modifying the way we teach them. Because again, knowledge is power, and um, it should not be restricted to um, universities or few classrooms or schools that are good at um, you know, providing for children with special education needs. It should be mainstream, because not everybody is the same. The more we realize about brain, the more we realize that uh, brain is extremely plastic. It means that it can repair itself at any time. It's not the way that we thought about, you know, once you are born that way, that's the way. No, we actually, the more you practice certain things and the more you um, are exposed to certain things, the more you can repair your connections. So there is so much more that we can do and the, in and the ignorance is only on <laughs> us, but we should not deny our children um, life. And so for me, I think in this day and age, with all the tools and all the advancements that we have and the knowledge, it is our duty to really not deny our children their chance to live fulfilled lives and to live out their potential. Okay? So thank you very much. And just to add to what Josephine has said, from my point of view as a consultant advising hundreds of families, getting a proper assessment and diagnosis is a really helpful first step. I find quite a lot of families avoid it, either out of a sense of trying to wish it away or more commonly they'll say, oh, but I don't want him labelled, I don't want people to be prejudiced against them. Just remember, no paperwork is going to change them. And if you commission a report privately, you're under no obligation whatsoever to share that with anybody else. Although you would be foolish not to. Because as well as a diagnosis, an EP or other professional report will give you a series of measures that schools ought to be taking to help your child. At this point, it's definitely best to call a formal meeting with the school. Don't rely on parents' evening or a five-minute chat with the teacher at the end of the school day. You ju there is, just isn't time to go into things properly, and your concerns won just won't be taken as seriously. So you need to ask for a meeting with the head teacher and the SENCO. That's the, the special needs coordinator, or they might be called a, a learning support coordinator. When you have that meeting, put your work head on. Because I find that parents are always anxious about being forthright and they don't want to cause friction with the school. Certainly you need to be pleasant and reasonable, but treat it like a task in the workplace which isn't being carried out properly. So present them with the issues, backed up by examples and times and where you've seen this happening, and ask them what support they can put in place, what outside expertise can they call on. But if you've gone past that point, if you've got the diagnosis, you've given them the expert recommendations, and yet you still find that schools are being obstructive or unhelpful or ignorant, or all three, there does come a time when you're best to cut your losses and move your child to another school. So when it comes to looking elsewhere, it's important to know what a school's obligations are. So all state schools are required by law to admit children with special educational needs and to make appropriate adaptations for them. The way they interpret though, that, though, can vary greatly. Some do no more than toe, toe the legal line, and they'll actively try to discourage you from applying. We hear so often of the head who says, oh, you, not, you want to go to St. Elsewhere up the road. They're really good with this sort of thing. Independent schools are free to select the pupils they want. So they can turn down your child, and frankly, you don't have a leg to stand on. You can recourse to disability discrimination legislation, but really, would you want to? If they don't want your child, it's not the place for him. I'm guessing some of you are here because parents are often attracted to independent schools for a child with additional needs because, they've, because they're smaller, they're perhaps less boisterous. But there is no uniformity. Some independent schools are really good with SEN, some aren't. So I'm going to quickly just run through a few of the key considerations when you're looking at a mainstream to try and establish which is good for SEN. The first, don't rely on an open day to make your choice. You must book a private appointment with the head and the SENCO and examine what they know about your child's condition and how they will cater for your child's individual needs. And just from talking to a head, you can get an idea of their mindset are they professionally interested in your child or are they huffing and puffing about all the, all the problems they can foresee? And ask the Senko about her background and qualifications. Does she have postgrad qualifications in SEN? 
is she doing it full time or is she the RE teacher with a few spare hours in the curriculum that's had it dumped on her? So ask the head about similar profile children they have in the school. Be wary if yours would be the only one with their condition. And ask them about the progress rates of children with special educational needs. Now they should be progressing in the same increments as all other children. It might be at lower levels, but the steps should be the same. And another golden rule is be absolutely upfront about your child's issues. Parents often ask me whether they should hold back an unflattering report or not mention something which might mean a school won't take their child. Don't do that. Give them everything. And you want to investigate what their version of inclusion is. Because even when children have considerable learning challenges, parents often prefer the idea of keeping their child in a mainstream environment. But sometimes inclusion means quite the opposite. You can find your child spending large portions of his day being taught on his own, separately, with an unqualified teaching assistant. So always check who is going to be delivering any one-to-one -one teaching and any therapy. And one other thing to watch out for is the enthusiastic amateur. It's really easy to be won over by a school who says they can deal with anything you're going to throw at them. But a school that's cautious, that wants to read all the reports, that wants to consult with other people, that wants to get all the staff involved before they give you an answer, well, that's the school I prefer. It's the one that's professional and knows what they're dealing with. The key thing when deciding between schools for a child with special needs is to look at the needs first and the academic levels second. You might have a very bright child, quite capable of getting a full set of GCSEs, but who's going to be so overwhelmed by the social and sensory aspects of a mainstream school that she'll spend her time cowering in the toilets and learn nothing. Or one who just cannot cope with the stress of single-shot GCSE exams and needs a different curriculum examined through continuous assessment. First and foremost, get your child into a school which understands his or her difficulties and leaves them in a fit state to learn.